Ciencia y Humanismo en la Academia Mexicana de Ciencias. Gracias a todos ustedes. Bienvenidos a la Academia Mexicana de Ciencias. Estamos iniciando este evento que llamamos Ciencia y Humanismo, del cual estamos orgullosos y muy contentos. Va a ser una jornada académica intensa y sin formalidades. No va a haber discursos, yo simplemente le estoy dando la bienvenida. Sin embargo, eh, creo que es eh, muy importante agradecer a las instituciones que hacen posible esta reunión. El Consejo Nacional de Ciencia y Tecnología, la Universidad Nacional Autónoma de México, la Universidad Autónoma Metropolitana, el CIMBESTAB, el Instituto Politécnico Nacional y la Secretaría de Educación Pública. Sin el apoyo de ellos no habría sido posible esta reunión. También agradecemos a las instituciones que tienen una, una, exhiben, una, exhiben material en, la, en nuestra expociencia. ¿sí? Agradecemos a todos los investigadores nacionales y extranjeros que han aceptado generosamente dedicar tiempo a esta reunión. A todo el personal de la academia, todo el personal que trabaja con Renata Villalba, que verdaderamente ha hecho un gran trabajo, y bueno, este, Regina también, que no la veo por ahí, ¿sí? que, que, sea, que realmente ha hecho mucho. Pido un aplauso para todos ustedes. Para todos. Pues gracias, en fin, a todos ustedes por su presencia. Esto es una fiesta del conocimiento, ¿sí? Y sin más, le dejo la palabra a Jaime Más, coordinador de Medicina de la Academia Mexicana de Ciencias, para que introduzca al primer ponente. Muy buenos días. Eh, es verdaderamente un placer el, eh, estar el día de hoy eh, aquí en, este, en esta reunión, especialmente sabiendo que es la primera de su clase, esperemos haya muchas de estas, independientemente del trabajo arduo que se le ha puesto a la reunión. Y en dos minutos quisiera hacer la presentación del profesor Robert Maley. Eh, el profesor Robert Maley eh, inició su carrera científica en la Universidad de Vanderbilt, en Nashville, Tennessee, eh, en el 63, eh, terminó en el 70. A partir de 1970 a 1975, eh, él fungió como investigador en el NIH en los Estados Unidos, en Bethesda, Maryland, eh, empezando como investigador y luego siendo director de una de las áreas de estudio en el, en el NIH siendo eh, cabeza, siendo coordinador de área. A partir de esa fecha, en el 1979, se movió a California, eh, eh, inauguró el Instituto Glaston, iniciando primero con el cardiovascular, eh, volviéndose también profesor de patología y de medicina de la Universidad de California en San Francisco, para en el 92 volverse presidente del, del instituto y inaugurar otros dos institutos del sistema Gladstone, que son el de neurociencias y el de estudios de, de, de inmunodeficiencia adquirida. En este momento son tres los institutos Gladstone que están funcionando de manera realmente muy, muy, muy exitosa. Eh, tiene una infinidad de trabajos publicados, más de 200 eh, eh, premios, eh, distinciones, muchísimas. Debo decir que él es miembro de la Academia de la Asociación de eh, Medicina Americana, es miembro de la, de la Sociedad de Investigación Clínica Americana, es eh, miembro del Instituto de Medicina y por supuesto también es miembro de la Academia Nacional de Ciencias de los Estados Unidos. Eh, Dr. Meli, uh, 20 years ago uh, I had the honor to work with you uh, uh, in, in your lab during a sabbatical leave that I had Uh, from the National University of Mexico, and it really was a pleasure for me because uh, it introduced me to the field of lipoproteins and lipid metabolism. It's been a pleasure to follow your work throughout these 20, 20 or so years. And um, today, uh, with great admiration, I'd like to introduce Professor Meili 
He's going to talk us about the fantastic story, this connection between the APO, E, and the, uh, and the, I would say the physiology, uh, uh, I would say connections that uh, uh, APO, E has with Alzheimer's disease and atherosclerosis. He's been able looking into the structural, uh, I would say, characteristics of APOE, he's been able to put together a really nice story related to uh, uh, Alzheimer's disease, and he's gonna be talking to us in this, in this regard. Thank you very much for coming to Mexico, Professor Meili. I hope you come back very soon. Well, thank you very much. It is truly an honor and a pleasure to uh, be here uh, to, uh, on this particular occasion especially. First of all, I want to congratulate the uh, National Academy of Sciences of uh, Mexico uh, on the occasion of this 50th anniversary. I bring greetings and congratulations from your sister organization, the National Institutes of the, the, the National Academy uh, of Sciences uh, in the United States uh, of America. May you continue to advance uh, science and research uh, here in Mexico for many more years, 50 and many times 50 uh, years uh, uh, at this uh, uh, occasion. And second, I want to thank uh, Professor Jaime Masaliva uh, for his wonderful hospitality to my wife and to myself over the last couple of days. This is our first visit to Mexico City, uh, and we have found it to be absolutely wonderful. The culture, the museums, the art, uh, and of course the food uh, has been uh, just uh, uh, outstanding. As, as Jaime said, he uh, did some of his early training at the Gladstone Institutes in San Francisco and we continue to be very proud of the fact that he came back to Mexico uh, and has continued to advance uh, his research uh, here uh, in uh, your country. And third, I do want to dedicate this lecture to your academy on this occasion. I want to dedicate the lecture to Professor Masaliva, and especially I want to, to uh, uh, make this uh, lecture special for the students uh, and the young uh, faculty, uh, the next generation of science for Mexico and for the world uh, in general. So today I would like to tell you about a story that began for me 40 years ago. The story is about a protein called apolipoprotein E, or simply ApoE, and its role in atherosclerosis and in Alzheimer's disease. The story that I will tell you about APOE began at Vanderbilt University in the late 1960s in the area of cardiovascular disease when I was in fact a medical student and a graduate student. After my training, the work continued at the National Institutes of Health and then for the last 32 years, this work has continued at the Gladstone Institutes in San Francisco, where it's morphed from work related to cardiovascular disease to work that now encompasses uh, neurological disease. APOE's life began as an important protein in the area of cardiovascular disease. We first identified it in lipoproteins in the hepatic Golgi apparatus. And then we learned that diets high in saturated fat and cholesterol induce this protein to a very significant extent. We then went on to define the fact that there are multiple forms, isoforms of ApoE, and to determine its important role in mediating receptor uh, into cytosis of plasma lipoproteins. The team that worked on those uh, areas 
in the first years. This is actually a photograph that only Jaime will recognize. Uh, it's a photograph that is uh, more than 30 years old, and it involves the investigators about whom st the story I will tell you. Doctors Berceau, Rahl, Inerarity, Weisgraber, and Petus. Now you can tell that this is an old photograph because if you look at this photograph, that's me, but that's 30 years ago, uh, in which I had reddish blonde hair, not grayish white hair. But that's where we are. So let's begin now uh, when APOE was discovered in the late 1960s. At that time, the field was just beginning to understand and actually to define plasma lipoproteins. And this illustrates what we now know to be a plasma lipoprotein, a spherical particle, several different classes of such. This is a very low density lipoprotein. In the center or the core of these spherical particles are the lipids, triglyceride, cholesterol, cholesterol ester, and so forth. And then on the surface are the, lipo, the apoproteins, or apolipoproteins. And it is these uh, proteins that determine uh, the fate uh, of the lipoprotein uh, in circulation. But in the late 1960s, we didn't even know where these lipoproteins came from. And we certainly didn't know anything about the proteins. One of my PhD uh, mentors at Vanderbilt had been looking at liver from a rat and found in the Golgi apparatus these spherical particles which he postulated might in fact be precursors of plasma lipoproteins specifically a uh, plasma uh, VLDL lipoproteins and so we went on then and my PhD thesis actually involved uh, isolating the rat liver Golgi apparatus that you see here, isolating the spherical particles from that apparatus, and then going on to prove, in fact, they were the precursors of plasma uh, lipoproteins, specifically VLDL. In fact, we established, looking at the apoprotein content of the Golgi VLDL, and the plasma VLDL, that the proteins were very similar. We didn't really know what these proteins were at that time. The one that I called VS2 actually turns out uh, to be uh, the APOE. Uh, now, APOE really burst uh, onto the scene as a major constituent of cholesterol-induced intestinal and hepatic remnant lipoproteins. We studied a whole variety of animal species as you see listed here. And we found that with fat and cholesterol in the diet, the major protein to be expressed was in fact what turned out to be the APOE lipoprotein. These lipoproteins, these cholesterol-rich lipoproteins, are highly atherogenic and they cause coronary uh, heart disease. However, the field uh, recognized that there were, in fact, three different forms of this protein. Three alleles of APOE that are coded on a single gene on chromosome 19. And they're referred to as epsilon 2, 3, and 4. And thus, as a human, we end up then with six different subtypes, a mixture of any one of these two uh, alleles, as you see uh, listed here. But truly, the understanding of these three isoforms came about when they were, in fact, sequenced. Now, in those days, we're talking about 1980 now. In those days, a protein was sequenced one amino acid residue after another. The young people here in the audience could do this work in a weekend to sequence such a small protein of 299 amino acids. But it took Dr. Rao at the Gladstone an entire year to sequence uh, this uh, protein. That's how things have advanced 
uh, over the years. And what we found was that there are, in fact, three major forms that differ by single amino acid substitutions occurring at residue 112 or 158. Here I'm summarizing for you um, a comparison of the three different uh, forms of ApoE. ApoE3 is the most common form. It's often referred to as the normal allele. ApoE2 differs from ApoE3 by a single amino acid interchange that occurs at residue 158 where there is a cysteine instead of the normally occurring arginine. Now this single amino acid substitution causes E2 to be defective in its ability to bind to lipoprotein receptors and to mediate the uptake of lipoproteins, resulting in the formation of the genetic disorder called type 3 hyperlipoproteinemia. Now ApoE4, on the other hand, differs from E3 at residue 112, where it has an arginine instead of the normally occurring cysteine. This doesn't affect lipoprotein receptor binding or lipoprotein metabolism, but in fact, we now know that it is uh, the major genetic risk factor for Alzheimer's disease, the apolipoprotein E4. Now, before I go on any further with any details about these three different isoforms, let me give you some more general background uh, on ApoE. As I've already said, it's a small protein, 34,000 molecular weight. It's primarily synthesized in the liver by hepatocytes, but the second most common site of synthesis for ApoE is in the brain, both by astrocytes and to a certain extent by neurons. Macrophages throughout the body also synthesize ApoE, including microglia that occur uh, in the brain. It's transported on various plasma lipoproteins, and there it has the important function of mediating binding and uptake of uh, lipoproteins by specific lipoprotein receptors, like the LDL receptor. Its major role is to participate in delivering cholesterol and other lipids to cells for membrane synthesis, repair processes, and uh, so forth. Now, by the mid-1970s, we had established that ApoE was, in fact, the major ligand for the LDL uh, receptor. The binding of ApoE uh, to the receptor is mediated through a cluster of positively charged lysine and arginine residues uh, in the vicinity of amino acid residues 136 uh, to 150. The role of ApoE in lipoprotein metabolism can be summarized as shown here and in just in general terms. For the experts, you will realize that this is a simplification. But in the context of having the normal form of ApoE, ApoE3, we find that it plays a critical role in mediating the uptake of lipoproteins called chylomicrons by the liver. Chylomicrons are those lipoproteins that are synthesized by the intestine to deliver uh, dietary uh, fats throughout the body, but specifically uh, to the liver. Now, very low-density lipoproteins give rise to LDL, the major cholesterol-carrying lipoprotein in the plasma, but along this pathway, about half of these particles are taken up by receptors in the liver. And again, it's ApoE that is the important component uh, responsible for that uh, uptake. However, in individuals that have the ApoE2, the form of ApoE that's defective in receptor binding activity and that results in type 3 hyperlipoproteinemia, we see the effect here. If you have defective E, you do not take up remnant, chylomicron remnants or the VLDL 
and these triglyceride and cholesterol-rich lipoproteins accumulate in the plasma, causing the genetic abnormality uh, type 3 hyperlipoproteinemia. And these lipoproteins are highly atherogenic, causing, as I've already mentioned, coronary artery disease. Now let's consider how ApoE actually binds uh, to uh, lipoprotein receptors. Over the years, the field clearly learned that these arginines and lysines in the vicinity of residues 136 to 150 in the ApoE protein were the residues that directly interacted with the lipoprotein receptors. We did site-directed mutagenesis of all of these residues and many others and showed that these are the ones that directly mediate the interaction of ApoE with lipoprotein uh, receptors. Now, a doctor in a rarity at the Gladstone, along with me, postulated that residue 158 that distinguishes ApoE2 from ApoE3, that's where the cysteine arginine interchange occurs, that it has an indirect effect on receptor binding. It in itself is not directly involved in binding to the receptor, but an indirect effect on the conformation of the receptor. However, it took some years before we were ever able to prove that postulate. But when X-ray crystallography was possible, and we looked at the detailed structure of ApoE3 and ApoE2, we could, in fact, confirm the postulate. This is just a portion of the ApoE3. And what we learned was, very interestingly, that arginine at residue 158, the site that distinguishes it from ApoE2, in E3, arginine forms a salt bridge with aspartic acid 154. And this allows, and we found, the side chains of the basic residues in 136, residues 136 to 150 to extend away from the helix. However, in ApoE2, when there's cysteine at residue 158, now aspartic acid forms a salt bridge with arginine 150 and distorts this whole region of the molecule. And that, we believe, is the way ApoE2 causes defective receptor binding activity. In fact, maybe you can appreciate that by looking at this electrostatic potential map on, the sur on a surface filling model of E3 and ApoE2. The basic residues highlighted here by this blue net, if you will, in the, in the region 136 to 150, you see a very nice basic patch on the surface of ApoE. We believe and, and have data indicating that this is what allows it to bind to the receptor. Here's arginine 158, way out of that site, in fact, pretty buried. But now, here in ApoE2, where there is, in fact, cysteine at residue 158, it's more prominent, and remember I said it distorts the salt bonds, bridge bonds, around this region, and I believe you can appreciate a distortion of that basic patch. And that's the way we believe that ApoE2, that single amino acid substitution at 158, actually affects amino acid residues in the area of 136 to 150, causing defective binding and setting the stage for the lipid disorder called type 3 hyperlipoproteinemia. Now let's turn our attention to uh, ApoE4 uh, and discuss how this single amino acid substitution has a profound effect on the overall conformation of ApoE4, resulting, as I will attempt to show you in the next few minutes, Result, indicating that that structural change is responsible for the uh, ApoE4 being involved in uh, Alzheimer's uh, disease. Now the first clue <coughs> that ApoE might actually be important in neurobiology came from the observation by a Dr. John Taylor at the Gladstone 
uh, in the mid-1980s when he realized that APOE was being produced in significant concentrations within the brain. What in the world was a heart disease protein uh, doing in the brain? And so that begins our journey into neurological disease. In association with collaborators at Stanford, I demonstrated that APOE was involved in uh, nerve injury and repair. But the real boost for APOE being important in neurobiology came in 1993 when Dr. Alan Roses and his group at Duke University established through genetic analysis that APOE, specifically APOE4, was linked to Alzheimer's disease. And since that, our, since that time, our group and many other groups around the country and the world have been looking at the mechanisms whereby APOE4 may be involved in neurodegenerative diseases, especially Alzheimer's disease. Now, the neurological disease studies that I'm going to tell you about were performed in association with my associates at Gladstone, Dr. Carl Weisgraber, Carl and I have now worked together approximately 39 years, so uh, a long history uh, with this protein. Dr. Yadong Huang is another uh, a young investigator that's worked with me for the past 15 or uh, 16 uh, years. Other investigators involved are also listed on the slide. Now let me just tell you a little bit to set the stage for our discussions of Alzheimer's disease, let me tell you about the disease. Alzheimer's disease is one of the most common devastating forms of dementia. In the United States alone, more than five million people are affected by this horrible, devastating disease. And this number is going to double in 15 years and more than triple to 15 million in the United States alone by the year 2050. The impact on families and uh, uh, of patients having this disease cannot be measured simply in dollars and cents. However, we know that last year, Alzheimer's disease alone cost the U.S. economy more than $170 billion. Uh, Presently, there are no effective medications that will cure or reverse the cognitive decline that we see in this disorder. There are, in fact, five drugs on the market, none of which are very effective. And as our populations age around the world, including here in Mexico, Alzheimer's disease is expected to skyrocket in the number of uh, uh, individuals that are affected. Still in the way of background, this is a normal brain, what we see. If you do a cross-section through the brain, we see the normal distribution of cells and fiber tracts that we recognize as normal. However, now on the right-hand side, we see the brain of a patient uh, with Alzheimer's disease. This brain is shrunken, as you can tell. If we look at a cross-section through the brain, we see a large loss of nerve cells and synaptic connections within the brain. Now this is the region of the brain known as the hippocampus. And this is where memories are formed and stored. Now I'll look at this area in the patient with Alzheimer's uh, disease. Markedly reduced uh, in size, markedly altered. That is, in fact, the effect of the disease. Now APOE4 has a very significant impact on Alzheimer's disease. It's important to, for you to know that APOE4 is not rare in the human population. About 25% of us have at least one APOE4 allele. If in fact there are 400 of us here this morning, that's 100 of us will actually have uh, this allele. APOE4 impacts Alzheimer's disease in two different ways. It increases the risk. If you're a homozygous for the normal form of E, E3, Alzheimer's disease risk is at about 20% during one's lifetime. But if you're a homozygous for APOE4, that risk includes, increases to 90%. 
heterozygotes uh, are in between. Second of all, ApoE4 increases the age of onset of Alzheimer's uh, disease. If you're homozygous for E3, Alzheimer's disease typically occurs around the age of 80, but if you're homozygous for E4, at 16 years earlier at the age of 68. For me, at my age, that's far too young to develop such a, uh, a terrible uh, disorder. But what is really important for you to remember is that if you look at all patients with Alzheimer's disease, 65 to 80 percent of them have at least one ApoE4 uh, allele. And thus, ApoE4, clearly established, is the major genetic risk factor uh, for Alzheimer's disease. Now, with respect to Alzheimer's disease, what is now appreciated is that there are multiple factors acting through various pathways causing the cognitive decline and the neurodegeneration. The amyloid hypothesis is, whoops, excuse me, the amyloid hypothesis is the most common hypothesis related to Alzheimer's disease, focusing on a peptide called the amyloid beta peptide, which does in fact cause neurotoxicity, a disruption of synaptic connections, the formation of plaques within the brain, leading to cognitive decline uh, and neurodegeneration. But it's also now clearly established from the work of a number of investigators around the world that apo there are ApoE isoform specific effects on this pathway and that ApoE4 can accelerate this whole uh, process. However, our data clearly indicate that ApoE4 can act independent of the A-beta or the amyloid pathway. That ApoE4 has a direct effect, independent of amyloid, on cognitive decline uh, and uh, neurodegeneration. ApoE4 alone has a number of detrimental effects when it's expressed in the brain. It impairs synaptic connect, uh, uh, connections. It causes direct neuronal toxicity, and it impairs learning and memory in a number of our ApoE uh, uh, animal model studies. In fact, I believe that ApoE4 is in fact the most important factor involved in Alzheimer's disease. Now a major clue for us concerning uh, the mechanism whereby ApoE4 uh, can have detrimental effects in the brain came from understanding the details of the structural differences that distinguish ApoE3, the normal form, from the structure of the abnormal form, uh, ApoE4. Work conducted in association with my colleague Carl Weisgraber. Now this is an illustration of what we believe to be the important difference between E3 and E4. As I've already told you, ApoE3 differs from ApoE4 by a single amino acid substitution, but that substitution has a profound effect on both the structure and the function of the protein. You can appreciate that the difference in the structure just from this cartoon, and, 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 and I'll show you data indicating that this is correct. ApoE4 has a much more compact structure. ApoE3 has a more open structure, and we believe that it is this structural difference that's responsible for ApoE4 uh, having a neuropathological uh, effects. E2 looks very much like ApoE3, having a more open uh, structure. Now in ApoE4, where there's arginine at residue 112, the key difference it causes other changes within the protein. And one important change that we found is that it causes the side chain of arginine 61 
to extend away from the four helical amino terminal bundle and to interact with an acidic residue, glutamic acid 255. And this, we believe, is the mechanism whereby ApoE4 has this more closed, this more compact, what I will show you, pathological conformation. But in ApoE3, with cysteine at 112, this arginine side chain at residue 61 is in fact tucked inside of the four helical bundle. And it's not so readily available to interact with glutamic acid 255. And thus, ApoE3 has a more open structure. We believe it is this structural difference that is responsible for ApoE4's neuropathology. Now, a few years ago, we envisioned that one way to prevent the detrimental effects of ApoE4 would be to find a small molecule, ultimately a drug, that would disrupt this ionic interaction, converting ApoE4 from this closed structure to a more open structure, in fact, more resembling ApoE3, both structurally and uh, functionally. In fact, we know, and I will show you, uh, that we can do this with small molecules uh, and that, uh, in fact, we can reverse the detrimental effects of ApoE4. But first of all, an important question that we had to answer was, does domain interaction occur in vivo, in cells? If it's just a biological phenomenon in the test tube, that's interesting, but not so important for the disease. So we went on to prove, in fact, that, that domain interaction does occur. Here we're looking at ApoE4, uh, in which uh, we have shown in cells using a technique called fluorescence residence energy transfer, or FRET, that, in fact, domain interaction occurs. In ApoE3 and ApoE4 constructs, they have YFP, the fluorescent molecule at the amino terminus, CFP at the carboxy terminus. They're transfected into nerve cells, and then we measure uh, the uh, uh, fluorescence uh, in emission. We've also gone on to develop this cellular assay as a way to screen for small molecules capable of disrupting domain interaction and an attempt to find a molecule that could, in fact, uh, become a drug. And so domain interaction, this structural difference that I told you I thought was important, actually does occur in vivo, and I will show you uh, that it is, in fact, important. This is the data of showing you the intracellular uh, fret. Here, if you have E3 expressed, you see a low fret fluorescence signal. With E4, you have a major signal uh, emitted, and we interpret that as indicating that the amino terminal and the carboxy terminal domains of ApoE4 are in fact in close uh, contact, giving us uh, this uh, FRET uh, signal. So I've just described for you the data that indicate uh, that ApoE4 has an, uh, an abnormal structure, and I've indicated that it also parallels an abnormal uh, function. But how does ApoE4 cause neuropathology? And what we know now is because of this abnormal structure of ApoE4 called domain interaction, that ApoE4 is susceptible to a neuron-specific proteolysis. There is a protease that we're identifying now that, in fact, uh, attacks ApoE4, not ApoE3 to the same extent, ApoE4 to a greater extent, resulting in the generation of neurotoxic uh, uh, fragments. And Dr. Yadong Huang is uh, identifying that protease uh, right now. Well, what we've shown is that nerve cells 
which are stressed or injured turn on the synthesis of ApoE. The uh, stresses or the injurious agents can be uh, any number of things that will lead to damage to a neuron. Those stressors can be aging. They can be oxidative stress, trauma, traumatic brain injury, concussions, a beta deposition uh, itself. All of these stressors turn on the synthesis of ApoE by nerve cells. Now, in the context of ApoE4 being produced, the E4 becomes a toxic. Well, what, why do, do neurons begin to synthesize ApoE when they are damaged? And that brings us back to the cardiovascular area, in which we learned that the function of ApoE is to participate in the redistribution of lipids for repair and remodeling. Now, in this case, repair and remodeling uh, of neurons. Well, what happens actually when ApoE4 is made in nerve cells? And what we found is that in the context of ApoE3, it's secreted from the cell and functions normally in the redistribution of lipids. But ApoE4 is recognized by this neuron-specific protease, which clips off the carboxyterminal 27 amino acids, resulting in this large fragment that now escapes the secretory pathway. It's not so well secreted. It enters the cytosol of the neuron, and one thing it does is it interacts with mitochondria, disrupting energy metabolism, and ultimately uh, causing uh, the neuropathology uh, that uh, we've talked about uh, already. We can prove some of what I just said, although I don't have time to go into all of the proof, uh, by showing you data uh, in which we're looking at the distribution of ApoE4 lacking the carboxy terminal 27 amino acids. This then is the large fragment that is generated by the proteolytic uh, cleavage. And what we see is that the fragment interacts with the mitochondria. The ApoE is labeled here in green. The mitochondria are tagged with DS red. And we, when we look at the merged image, the yellow uh, color indicates that a large percentage in this three cells shown here, the major percentage of the ApoE fragment generated ends up associated uh, with the mitochondria. Here's some additional uh, data uh, illustrating the susceptibility of ApoE4 versus ApoE3 uh, to the neuron-specific uh, 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 protease. The initial clip that occurs in the neuron is to generate a 29 to 30 KD fragment lacking the carboxy terminal, uh, usually 27 amino acids, off of that terminus. And then there are secondary cleavages that occur, generating fragments of ApoE4, specifically in the range of 12 to 20,000 molecular weight. All of these fragments we now know are neurotoxic, cause a number of detrimental effects in nerve cells. Well, domain interaction is in fact responsible for the susceptibility, and you can see that here, because if we if we look at ApoE4, in which we've mutated the arginine at residue 61 to a threonine, this form of ApoE now lacks this domain interaction that, uh, that I've described for you, and now this form of ApoE4 is resistant to proteolysis. If we mutate its partner that causes that ionic interaction that results in that compact structure, Glutamic acid 255 to an alanine. Now, this form of ApoE is also resistant uh, to proteolysis. We can see these fragments within the human brain. And here we're looking at uh, the temporal cortex, fragments from the temporal cortex of patients with Alzheimer's disease, aged match controls that are non-demented, 
<coughs> you can see the ApoE4 uh, genotype listed above. And what we see in Alzheimer's disease is a large accumulation of these neurotoxic fragments that I've just described for you. And there is a dose relationship between ApoE3 and ApoE4. E4-3s have more fragments than 3-3s. 4-4s, the homozygous E4, has the majority or the largest amount uh, of uh, the fragments. Now, a therapeutic approach that we have undertaken, and I've already alluded to it uh, previously, was to find a small molecule that would, in fact, disrupt this interaction between arginine-61 and glutamic acid-255, converting the ApoE4 to a structure more like uh, ApoE3. Uh, In fact, we have now found several such small molecules, three separate chemical classes of molecules, uh, which in fact can disrupt this interaction and can reverse many of the detrimental effects of ApoE4. We've identified active small molecules that block the ApoE4 domain interaction. We've gone on to show that some of these molecules can in fact, uh, uh, can in fact alter the function in cultured neurons and in vivo uh, in uh, mice. Now I've already mentioned for you, and here again I can't show you all the data, but I, I've mentioned that ApoE4 interacts with the mitochondria, in fact disrupts uh, normal electron transport processes uh, within the mitochondria and starves the cell of ATP. This is some of the data showing you here we're expressing ApoE3 in neurons and now we're looking at one of the electron transport uh, uh, enzymes, specifically the mitochondrial cytochrome C oxidase or COX-1. In the E3 we see a large amount of that COX-1. In the E4 we see it is uh, decreased. Now if in fact we treat these E4 expressing neurons with one of our small structure corrector molecules, that's what we call them, we can see a dose effect and we can rescue the reduction uh, in the COX-1 uh, activity that we see uh, in the ApoE4 cells. Well, we can do this in vitro with these small molecules. Can we do it in vivo and the, in mice? And the answer is uh, yes. And we have looked at a specific small molecule called PY101, in which we've treated ApoE transgenic mice with daily doses of this small molecule, given either intraperitoneally or subcutaneously. And what I will show you now is that this small molecule, as well as others that disrupt domain interaction, reverse several of the detrimental effects of ApoE4 in the ApoE4 transgenic mice. Specifically, this molecule reduces the ApoE fragments that are toxic in the brain and increases the level of the mitochondrial cytochrome oxidase, the COX-1, uh, in the brain. Now for the pharmacologists here in the audience, you will recognize that PY101 does in fact display uh, good kinetics. It achieves a good plasma concentration, and especially important, it achieves a good concentration in the brain, especially when given uh, interperitoneally. Now let's just quickly look at the um, uh, biological, or the functional uh, effects of having this molecule delivered uh, to the brain. Here's one set of data in which we're looking at the total uh, fragments of ApoE4 that are in the brain of this uh, animal. In the case of being treated with PY101, we see that the fragments are reduced by comparison to the vehicle-dosed uh, control. 
And in fact, we see that that reduction in these neurotoxic fragments of ApoE4 actually correlates with the concentration of this small molecule structure corrector uh, within the brain. The higher the concentration of this small molecule, the fewer the fragments uh, that we measure uh, within the brain. We can also see an effect of the small molecule on the mitochondria. And here we're looking at uh, COX-1 uh, levels in the brain. This actually is in the hippocampus, the, the, target, the area we really want to target. We can, in fact, see within the hippocampus that the COX-1 levels are increased in comparison to the non-dosed uh, control. And so to summarize this biologic uh, data as I conclude uh, the lecture, what we have found with this structure corrector molecule and other such molecules is that we can reduce the neurotoxic fragments, something like 20 to 30 percent. There is an inverse correlation between the concentration of that molecule and the fragments that are formed within the brain, and that we can increase the COX-1 levels in the hippocampus, usually in the range of 50 to 60 percent. And so the structure corrector, based upon our understanding of the difference between E3 and E4, can be shown to have a beneficial effect uh, in ApoE4 expressing mice. But only time will tell uh, if, in fact, this approach uh, will work uh, in humans. In the animal, it works. Humans, next time. <laughs> so in conclusion then, uh, I've reviewed some of our data uh, uh, on the structure corrector uh, program, which is identified small, which identifies small molecules that can convert E4 to an E3 molecule structurally uh, and functionally. Other approaches to treating Alzheimer's disease associated with E4 may require us to uh, block the protease and to prevent the formation of the neurotoxic fragments. And we're looking for small molecules uh, to do that presently. And we have some, but they are not so potent. And we're also looking for small molecules that would protect the mitochondria because we believe this is the final common pathway to causing neurodegenerative disease. Uh, and this is a very uh, new uh, program. So then I've tried to review for you and during this lecture the life and times of what for me has been a very uh, fun uh, protein um, uh, occupying uh, me for the last uh, 40 uh, plus uh, years. Reviewing its past and its present uh, history in cardiovascular disease uh, and in neurological disease. I am sure that this protein has more mysteries, more secrets to, review, to reveal uh, to us as time goes by and it's for you here in this audience uh, to discover uh, those secrets. And I thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Meli, for your fantastic conference. Uh, and I would say that this is a really nice, fantastic story uh, that we like to hear in Mexico in, in, the, in the sense that it is really nice to see how basic research, when basic research, uh, research is done in the proper way, uh, in the years to come, you can get really nice uh, um, approaches, clinical approaches to this kind of, of work. Then uh, I believe the story that you just told us is not, is not the end, as you say. I'm sure that we'll, we'll see more uh, really nice data from your lab in the years to come. And uh, uh, we would like to thank you again for the fantastic work and the conference that you just delivered us. Thank you very much again.
Just, eh, eh, bueno, eh, tomando en cuenta el tiempo eh, restringido que tenemos para las pláticas, si alguno de ustedes quisiera hacer alguna pregunta, algún comentario con el profesor Meli, por favor, lo podemos hacer allá afuera.